Olympics is simply allowing another person to do what they could not do based upon a shortcoming um, societally. And so we don't have issues with equity in life. We just have issues at times with equity in business as though we're in a zero sum game where I think there's enough room for all of us to win. You talk, that's, that is incredible. You talk about the numbers though. And uh, we've been told there's a fair amount of attrition for employees of color within five years of their initial employment, particularly for those transferring in from other states here to Minnesota. Greg, is that the case at U.S. Bank? And if so, what do you think some of the reasons are for that? Why are people not staying? Uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> and, but, it's a, but it's an issue for all companies. You know, most companies struggle with attrition. I mean, very few times if you if you offer people the right opportunities, you pay them a fair wage, most times you can attract people to your organization. You're a well-managed organization, you have good financial results, you have high ethical standards, you can get people to come. The challenge, Renita, is we don't grow and develop people into leadership positions. Every organization is more diverse at the bottom of the organization. Where you start to see the career cliff happen is when you, when you move into those levels of executive leadership and senior leadership in the organization, the C-suite of the organization, board representation. Diversity and, diversity and inclusion has been around for 50 years. And you could argue that we're worse off today than we were in the 70s. When you look at the, the number of, of CEOs of color, board representation, and so this notion of attrition is not new, and I think specific to our region, one of the reasons we struggle with it is because we hire for diversity, but we reward assimilation. Right? We actually don't want you, we, we recruit you because you're diverse, but then you enter the organization and you enter these cultures that really don't support who you are. Yeah. They really don't support you adding value in the ways that you can contribute, the things that, that really underscore your life experience and what you bring to it. And so the issue is not about um, attrition. The issue is, are we hiring for diversity but rewarding assimilation? That's where the system is broken. That one is, of the places it's that's broken. A we can go on a long time about that. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a really key point. And let's talk more numbers when we talk about your pocketbook. According to most recent estimates, Camille, from census data, median wages are 32.7% higher for white workers than workers of color. How can we seek to accelerate growth that is more equitable for the long term? That's a huge gap. You know, Benita, when it comes to accelerating growth, I think you have to look at two things. You have to look at talent management and unconscious bias, and then you have to look at pay equity. And when it comes to talent management, how are we progressing people through the pipeline? How are we developing them? How are we retaining them? Uh, what are the stretch opportunities are we giving um, employees? And I think when we look at unconscious bias, it really is, you know, at the end of the day, anyone with a brain has bias. So we all have brains, so we all have bias. And one of the things that we have to do is really attack and recognize that unconscious bias leads to micro inequities, which are almost like termites that eat away at the core of an individual. And so we have to figure out how do we interrupt those micro inequities and those biases. When it comes to pay equity, one of the things that we've been trying to do is making sure that we pay everyone equitable, women and multicultural talent around the world at Boston Scientific. And the wonderful thing that we were able to find out in our recent analysis is that we had no significant statistical disparity for 99.9% .9 of our employees. So that 0.9% that tells us that we still have work to do um, and that we're unfinished. But those are the two areas I think that we need to focus on. Emmanuel, how would you respond to both of those comments? Well, one, uh, Greg, which is sort of fascinating, um, because I do think that's, when I first spoke to Oprah, I said this, I said that um, so many of us live in denial, D-E-N-I-A-L, don't even know I am lying. Uh, and so many of us don't even know what we're lying about. Um, I think that's what got Oprah to partner with me on the <laughs> Here we are using it again. Um, no, and so when you bring up the point of we seek diversity but reward for assimilation, I think that was very illuminating because as companies, corporations, individuals, as people, we all have to do better jobs of understanding where are our blind spots, to Camille's point, because we each have blind spots, but after understanding the blind spots we have, are we going above and beyond to course correct for them? 
uh, when you have a car, you understand you have a blind spot. So before switching lanes, you'll look right, you'll look left, or if you can't drive, you have the little small microscope mirror inside the side mirror for those of y'all that can't drive. Um, and so we all go above and beyond because of blind spots. So I think now that blind spots are being illuminated, are, what are we going to do about going above and beyond to course correct? Okay, very, very essential. The murder of George Floyd had an effect on our community, the country, and the world. How has your web series, your books, how have they been received since that time? And has that spurred on the conversations that we need to be having? Man, um, well, first and foremost, this is just a great time to say um, thank you all for having me. Um, it's, it's very humbling to see how it has been received. Um, the, the greatest story I share is, after I started the web series, it was seen by 25 million people in five days. Um, I get a call from a no-caller ID number, the first one, Acho, McConaughey speaking. <laughs> I want to have a conversation. I was like, McConaughey? <laughs> so my boy started getting high-pitched, Matt, Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> uh, and so, true story, I wasn't planning on doing a second episode because I didn't want to be a one-hit wonder, right? Like you come out with one smash album, and you can't follow it up. But McConaughey calls and he says, hey, let's do another episode. I say, hey, uh, let's do it in four days. He says, how about tomorrow? I said, like, hey, okay, <laughs> McConaughey wants to do it tomorrow, so we do it the next day. Then five days later, I get a call from another no call ID number, and that's, hi, Emmanuel, Oprah speaking. Um, and so, but, but of all the calls, of all the views, the one that touched me most, which is what leads me to believe as a society we're headed in the right direction, I got an email from a 70-year-old woman named Lynn. She said, Dear Emmanuel, um, I grew up in rural Alabama. I was a flight attendant. I didn't go to school with any Negroes. However, watching your video series has taught me I still have room to change. Please don't give up on me yet. I love you, my son and my brother. Mm. Um, yeah, y'all can clap for that. Um, clap for that, please. And when I, when I received that email, and I always close my eyes because I have to re-visualize the words as I read them in my, in my mailbox, it taught me that hearts are changing, minds are opening, the aperture of our understanding is growing. Just by sitting in this stadium today, we're all committed to at least listen, to dialogue towards change, because realistically, it all is going to start with us. Like I said, Racial equality isn't a finish line we'll cross, it's a road we'll travel, but we all collectively have to choose to travel it together. Christina, do you agree? Do you feel like there's some some positive, are people having the conversations they need to be having? What are you noticing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot more courage and space that is being made for us to have these conversations now in a way that we weren't having them before. Um, and that's the hope is that we continue on that path. And you know, I think of my 10 year old daughter and the conversations she's having at school with her friends as they explore racism and how it shows up and, and they explore you know, gender issues and where, where it's showing up for them in their school and the space that they're making. I think we have, a long way to go. I agree that it's a journey, and the student who spoke earlier said that. This is a journey we're on all together. It's important that we not lose hope and not let the obstacles that we're going to encounter in the way get us off of the path, right? We, we have to keep at it, even though it's going to continue to be tough. And you have a uh, employee resource group or network that's, that's helping. Yeah, I, I do think employee resource groups and business resource groups are important ways for companies to create space for identity affirmation for different groups and also for allies to learn and partner and show support for each other. So I think, you know, companies can, we've been on the journey at Thomson Reuters of having business resource groups for 20 years. Um, and they start in the space of creating confirmation, affirmation, um, understanding, support, sharing of experiences. The, the good thing is that over time they can evolve and you can, as we have a lot of our leaders out in the audience today that are our business research group leaders, they become leaders and influencers in the company. And they are the ones that start to tell you, hey, what you're doing over here is out of touch with our experience and what we need. And getting at defining what people need is where you can have really important allyship and leadership from these business resource groups. Do you think it has an impact, Emmanuel? 
And what specifically? These types of resource groups, these networks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we have to do a better job of creating spaces, uh, like Christina just spoke on, is creating these safer environments. Um, I, uh, maybe it was Camille who, who mentioned earlier, if you are in a space and you do not feel welcome in that space, you will not stay in that space very long. And so many companies try to serve individuals, but they don't even know the best way to serve them. I'll tell on myself, because I just feel like that's the best way to learn is <laughs> by making myself sound like an idiot. Um, true story, this happened. So I was hosting a conversation and I was talking to the chief disability offer of a Fortune 500 company, a major company. And I was trying to be, uh, she, was, um, she was deaf, partially deaf majority deaf and I was trying to be very suave in my introduction right so I was like here's what we're gonna do we're gonna say she's hearing different yeah that'll work man you're hearing different <laughs> I was like no it's not good no, it's not good we're gonna introduce her and say she's hearing unique yeah hearing unique <laughs> so I introduce her and I'm like you know please welcome the you know the hearing unique uh, whatever she's like Emmanuel your introduction made me cringe I was like uh oh, <laughs> oh boy. why she said, because I have a disability, but people only focus on the dis and not the ability. Yeah. And I feel like my mistake is what so many people, the mistake so many people make. How can you know how to best serve black people if you don't consult black people? So while I expended the energy and I expended the effort and I went above and beyond trying to serve this person, I didn't serve them in the best way they knew how. How can you best serve women if you don't actually consult women? <laughs> so now you got a room full of men making decisions on behalf of women. You got a room full of white wow. people making decisions on behalf this of black <laughs> people. And while my heart was in a great place, my time Hallelujah. was expended, my energy was expended, I Where didn't actually serve the person I desired to serve All until over the I country? listened to how she yes. wanted the world? to be served. And so I just believe that, yeah, we have to do a better job of listening because it's not for lack of trying. When you talk about recruitment of uh, people from underserved communities and underrepresented communities, I'm thinking of the um, lawsuit that's happening in the NFL right now with Brian Flores. Fired from a job, said he was interviewed, but not really considered. He does have a job now. But what are your thoughts about what really goes on behind, you know, on behind the scenes? Uh, is it just lip service that some companies do when they're trying to recruit, or are really companies wanting to recruit a diverse employment? Great question. Um, as always, I'll answer in story form. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Benita, if you and I were to go to a restaurant, and if you and I were to walk into the front door of the restaurant, and as soon as we walk in, I start patting down my, my, my pants pockets like, Benita, I lost my keys, can you help me search for them? You would say, of course, Emmanuel. So we walk outside, we turn right, and I start searching under the nearest light pole, to which you'd say, but Emmanuel, we, we didn't come in from the right, we came in from the left. I might respond, I know, but this is where the light is, so this is where it's easiest to see. <laughs> That's what so many companies do. They don't actually search for the place they're trying to acquire the information. They just search for where it's easiest to assess. In the NFL, just like most corporations, it's not actually a meritocracy. You don't hire the best or the hardest working. It's based upon nepotism and cronyism. You hire your family and you hire your friends. And so if historically, like Greg referenced earlier, our country was founded based upon white men and our country is based upon nepotism and cronyism to a high degree, you hire your family and you hire your friends, then white men will hire white men, who will hire white men, who will hire white men, etc. So at the bottom you might see diversity, but once again it will bottleneck. So I do think so much lip service is being paid. But again, the last example I will give, because I think that it isn't for lack of intention, it's for lack of awareness. So I'll make this very plain and very clear. Um, the Super Bowl champions of last year, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they had the most diverse staff in the history of the NFL. Several women were employed, several black men were employed, the most diverse staff in history. But their head coach, Bruce Arians, he was the first white coach to have a black roommate at Virginia Tech in 1975. Y'all can brag on this information later. You'll sound like a genius. <laughs> Conversely, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, Jerry Jones, he's never hired a black head coach. I believe he's only hired four black coaches out of the head coach, defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, four out of roughly 37 in his tenure there. But Jerry Jones, when he was a captain of the Arkansas football team, that football team was not integrated. 
So think about the polar difference during the most permeable years of these individuals' lives. That polar difference will play a role. So when people say, well, Emmanuel, do you think they're a racist in the NFL? No, I don't think they're racist. I think they're racially ignorant. I think they're racially insensitive. And there is a difference. And so it's just a matter of being mindful of your most permeable years. What are you gravitating towards and how is it playing a role in your adulthood decisions? I like the way you explain things in stories. It really helps, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, Greg, what are your thoughts on recruitment? What, what do we need to be doing as far as recruiting the, the brilliant people out there who are not getting the jobs they should? You know, I, I think we've got to focus on, you know, so much of diversity recruiting is about changing numbers on a scorecard. It's about, you know, being able to meet some sort of compliance standard and the, the focus has to shift from changing numbers on a scorecard to changing behavior. And I believe you start with what's the, what's the business objective? I thought Emmanuel's example of, of the NFL is a perfect one. If the goal is who is best qualified to lead an organization or a team of primarily 70% African American men, I would argue that probably an African American man <laughs> is probably best positioned because of his life experience. The Lord knows there's enough qualified coaches in the league to lead these men into battle every Sunday afternoon. And so it's organizations that you think about, what are we trying to accomplish with the business? What are the skills and capabilities that are required? The scorecards are important because they help us measure progress, but it's not the mandate. The mandate is how do we, how do we bake a bigger pie for everybody? This work is not about creating favor. This work is about creating parity. It's about how do, you, how do you democratize opportunity for everybody? And if you think about the best ways that we're going to move our organizations into the future with demographic changes, cultural changes that are happening right before our eyes. I mean, we've never moved this fast before, but I can guarantee you we're never gonna move this slow again. <laughs> and so we have to hire talent that understands that has a, a, a broad life experience and bring unique capabilities. And you only find those places where you gotta fish where the fish are. You know, so often, so often I think all of us get challenges of, well, shouldn't we just hire the best person? Well, yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. <laughs> How do you know you have the best person if you continue to recruit from the same places? You got a lake in the back of your house and you pulling guppies out the lake and you think all the guppies are the best fish ever. <laughs> but there's a lake, I'm doing a story thing now, I'm sorry. <laughs> So you don't realize there's a lake over there that got salmon and like all kind of stuff in it, right? And so we've got to understand, like, if you cast a broader net, we get greater talent. I could go on, but I know we're done. Camille, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, what people don't know is I live with an NFL agent. So, Emmanuel, I can tell you that was, it's been part of our discussion uh, for the last couple of months now. Uh, and one of the things I've had to say to him is, you know, you have to leverage all talent to yield the best performance. You have to create a high performance culture. You have to retain, you have to retract, and you have to develop folks. And I think one of the things that um, we've learned is that you really need to look at the pool and get people in the pool to develop the pool to compete for the roles. This is not about giving anyone anything that they don't deserve. We want a pool of women and multicultural talent that can compete. That is the key word. But if you don't allow and create the pool, you can't allow for the competition. And at the end of the day, that's what we wanna do. You know, um, in 2017, our CEO, Mike Mahoney, invited the deans of the historical black colleges and universities for the engineering schools. And I remember he said to me, he said, they'll never come, Camille. They'll never come to Minnesota, it's too cold. I said, <laughs> They will come, Mike, if you invite them. And they came. And we showcased them Minnesota. We showcased them Boston Scientific. We introduced them to our patients and the life-saving technology. And they said, wow. And we created a relationship that then has fostered to where we show up on their board now. We are part of their board advancing minority interest for engineering. We now go to the Black Engineer of the Year Awards consistently every year and increase the number of on-the-spot offers that we offer to talent. 
And because of those relationships and because of the investment, we have created pools for people to compete. And then when they can't get the job or don't get the job, we just don't leave it at that. We explain to them what are the competencies that they then need to go get to then come get this job. Right, right. And that's where we need to be. Wow. Incredible conversation here. It's such powerful words from all of you. We could go on all night, but we're going to have to bring some students up here too <laughs> to get their perspectives as well.